Hello and welcome to episode 28 of Airs for Architecture with me, Ambrose Gillick. I'm talking today with Harriet Harris, Dean of the School of Architecture at the Pratt Institute in New York, about her writing, teaching and activism. We speak about two of her most recent books, Working at the Intersection, Architecture After the Anthropocene, published by Reba Books this year, as part of their Design Studios series, a collection of articles and case studies Harriet edited with Naomi House, and Architects After Architecture, Alternative Pathways for Practice, a volume of essays Harriet edited with Rory Hyde and Roberta Macasio, published by Routledge in 2020. I think we need to be cautious to assume that architecture will just carry on because somebody invented it about 250 years ago. Unless we keep questioning where our relevance is and what our impact is and actually start to manifest an actual impact, then one should assume that it will be just a confection of nice skills to acquire at undergraduate level. So I think that this idea of decolonization needs to include a questioning as to what the hell a discipline is and whether or not that even needs to be there. These infrastructures we've inherited, much like linguistic frameworks, are just constructs. They're not real. We invented them all. They're not laws. They're things that we invented, which means we can get rid of them tomorrow if we like. A is for Architecture, a podcast about architecture, buildings, urban culture and space. Oh, hello and welcome to another episode of AS for Architecture. I'm talking today with Harriet Harris. Harriet, would you like to introduce yourself? Good morning, Ambrose. Um, my name is Harriet Harris, and that's Dr Harriet Harris. Um, for those not familiar with the feminist movement that actually emphasises the importance of female doctors um, in, in, in making sure that they refer to their prefix. Um, in order to communicate the fact that actually there's more women enrolled, enrolled in doctoral, pro- doctoral programmes globally than there are men, um, but we are often just assumed to be the nurses yeah, in academia and in medical realms um, of, of our disciplines, um, you know, because it more, the more masculine, well, doctor is, evokes a, ma- a more male association typically, so hence the reference, not some self-aggrandising statement or anything. Um, I, stand, and, I, I stand corrected. I, obviously, obviously, I didn't mean to diminish. Oh, gosh, I didn't mean to correct you. I was actually just uh, just not correcting you at all. Just actually, you know, this is uh, my political ethics. So I, d- I don't prescribe that you should adopt mine. I'm just, you know, being true to my own. So don't worry. I wasn't trying to correct you. No, not at all. I think we should come to this later, though, because I think it's a really fine point. But anyway, carry on introducing yourself because there's a lot to introduce. Okay. Oh, yeah, we can skip that. You know, people are very good with Google. Um, They can find information, um, you know, and and misattributions and and misquotes everywhere. In fact, I think Um, and maybe some things out there are true. Um, But the main thing is, you know, um, to paraphrase Norma Malia, you know, rumors of my death have been greatly exaggerated. I'm still alive and semi well in New York, um, running the School of Architecture in the role of dean. Nothing religious, although, you know, that is the, if you like, the imperialist association and the origins of the term. Um, and um, yes, I've been doing that for now three years. I write books, um, which is interesting. As a dyslexic, ADD, um, neurodiverse person, that's a bit like basically trying to decorate a Christmas tree, having been shot out of a rocket. But every now and again, I think I write readable things. I'm a qualified architect in Britain, but not in the US because we do not have reciprocity of recognition for qualification. I need to say that kind of often, apparently, otherwise the AIA will show up and, I don't know, steal my cat and hold me to ransom. And um, what else do I do? I mean, my thesis broadly is, you know, architecture, question mark. Um, that's it. No, just kidding. It, it's really un- trying to understand what architecture is po- capable of, um, because at the moment I feel that it really isn't living up to um, its many possible applications um, and societal ecological transformation. Um, so that's kind of it. And I would like to say also, Ambrose, completely amazing person. Um, we met when we were undergrads at Manchester University. And um, I think both of us were, you know, the oddballs, the, the marginals, what Jerome might fondly call, you know, the peripheral crowd. Um, and uh, I do like paraphrasing Jerome, I'm sure he doesn't mind, you know, retrospectively and posthumously. And, um, you know, there was, Ambrose doing these exquisitely delicate drawings and there was me trying to run um, that took days and were beautiful like these wonderful hand-drawn things and there was me with my kind of you know building these vast models um, which always had to have some political contextualization at the time uh, that what was happening was we were annihilating lots of sheep because they were poisoned by some infection that was largely the fault of agricultural um, you know, engine of, of, of food consumption. And um, so there was actually a smoking pyre in my final exam made out of tiny scale sheep at the end of my model. 
Um, so yeah, we kind of were the oddballs together, the marginals, um, and hence our friendship flourished. Um, so Ambrose introducing him, despite the fact this was not agreed to or anything, non-consensual introduction is truly fabulous. And, you know, one should pay attention to the things he says when later somebody interviews him. Oh, that's very sweet. I did, I forgot about, I mean, you're right, the, uh, the, um, the influence of the, of the, sh- of the um, livestock crisis. What was that? BSE, wasn't it? One of the many things. It was, yeah, it was kind of like, unbelievable. she got jealous a, about mad cow disease, yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, they were going around shooting and burning animals. Foot and mouth, yeah. But it was interesting that, because that, that third year at Manchester, we, you, me and a few others, kind of got tired. I mean, Manchester was really interesting in, for, my, for me in the first and second year because it was quintessentially alienating as an experience. Like I had can't, gone into architecture with this idea about it being this one kind of thing, very much to do with building and making, because that's my background, my, my family background. And then we didn't even have studios, did we? Like we didn't have any way of, like we had studio buildings, but no, no kit. And we kind of forced the issue. Yeah, we had a few preoccupations. Um, one of them was certainly the fact that there weren't drawing boards anymore, but then everyone was still, they were in that kind of, you know, it was the beginning of the, the great parametric seduction when everyone was really like fascinated with form making in virtual space. And yeah. the traditionalists like Cassie were like, yeah, the CAD's all great and everything, but we still think there are some elements of drawing, like kinesthetic, hand-driven illustrating that actually has agency in terms of the quality of architectural outcomes. And we were sort of considered at time to be heretics living in the past, you know, like sort of Luddites of architecture. So we clung on to this ideal. And of course, what instead was happening instead of a studio environment was, you know, because everybody was at home, um, you know, on their computers designing because laptops couldn't carry the capacity for the many CAD programs we were required to use. Um, you know, you'd come in for a tutorial once a week or twice a week, and that was kind of it. There was, or a lecture. And that was, there wasn't really a, a social, there wasn't a cultural, if you like, space within the studio, which mm. I think was a huge issue. And everybody did work in, in self-imposed isolation. Mm. Um, but it was a, a technological, I, I think it was largely prescribed by the limitations of the technologies of that early parametricism mm. era. And our naivety about the quality of those, that output and that form of production, because we were all a bit starstruck, weren't we? It was a bit mechanization takes command. It it was, and I remember remember there there being this kind of, I don't know if it was apocryphal, but story that went around the architecture school that one of the students at final show had been picked up by Pixar for doing really good animations of their building. And we were like, oh, look, Pixar. Yeah, there's a life beyond sitting in an architect's practice after your part two detailing car parks for 10 years before you get your part three. I mean, yeah, it was quite tantalizing, wasn't it? Thinking it about was. them. And that's the subject of your first book. The first book that I got um, sent by your publishers, Architects After Architecture. I mean, it's not exactly that, but it's this idea that this architectural education is actually more useful than we sort of recognize perhaps. Yes, I mean, I mean, obviously people don't buy the book. By now, there'll be a free PDF somewhere lurking on Google. So, you know, I know you, you all pay for education and I think that's appalling in itself. So until the revolution, just get a free PDF from somewhere. But yeah, the principal conceit of the book is, um, yeah, 66% of architecture graduates in the UK won't become architects, but they what's do the, have... What's the percentage um, in America, do you know? Um, it's about the same, actually. I mean, it's one of those things that, let's just say the ACSA and the AIA, and sorry to unpackage the acronyms, um, the American Collegiate um, Schools of Architecture, that's ACSA, and then AIA being the American Institute of Architects. And if you want to get technical, you've got NEAB, which is the National Architecture Accreditation Board. That's which the is basically the ARB. Yeah, RIBA. ARB forward slash RBA. Uh-huh. Yeah, some, some, that's one hell of an unhappy marriage. I think RBA is still doing the education side, but under the, you know, uh, onerous watchful eye of ARB. But anyway, so um, they would obviously rather not tout these statistics, but it's true. And it's not, I think my issue was that, you know, rather than, uh, you know, there's so much protectionism in architecture and I got a bit tired of people saying, oh God, you know, the project managers have taken over, you know, bits of our job and we're rescinding all of these things that we do. And I thought, well, God, yeah, we do rather a lot and we all do it. You know, it's a Jacqueline of all trade, you know, mistress of none scenario, isn't it? If you're doing quite so many things to a certain level of expertise and the expertise becomes more and more diffuse and dilute till, you know, the word expert is no longer applicable. Mm. So, 
I think that if you think just going back to what architecture is, you know, this exposure to all these different epistemologies from, you know, the maths, from maths and sciences and, and you know, political, hi historical, creative epistemologies then actually and then the multifarious disciplines that are the offspring of all those epistemologies then really and I often say this so I'm just going to repeat myself because I'm rather pleased by this you know private joke or not so private joke that you know architecture is in fact you know the love child of really one hell of a you know a, a kind of swingers party and I think in some ways that's what gives it its superpower its ability to have drawn from all of these different disciplines and epistemologies that makes it incredibly agile, transferable and flexible. And I think that my issue was, while architecture spent a lot of energy and time belittling people who weren't registered architects, and it's very acute in the US, more so than the UK, I think, never mind the legal, if you like, challenges of using terms inappropriately and blah de blah um, The reason why architects aren't paid much is bugger all to do, actually, with whether or not we're protectionist about title or role. It's just that we're quite rubbish and irrelevant. And that's why we don't get paid very much and less and less, in fact. And I think that the tedium of blaming people who, you know, call themselves architects who haven't got this architectural qualification is a complete distraction. And I was concerned about the fact that, you know, what happens to this afterlife of architectural graduates? Where do they go and what do they do? And that's what the book's about. It, it really wanted to speak to people who had gone off after doing an architecture degree and either gone into some sort of recovery state and then gone and done something completely different. Um, or stayed in architecture, but on the margins, pushing and agitating for architecture to expand its remit to just become more powerful and relevant and in many ways be the antithesis of what mainstream architecture, frankly, is. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a perennial question, though, isn't it? So because like, we've, this has been being argued for now for a long time and the, your voice remains I mean, you're the Dean of Pratt, so you've obviously been brought into the fold and that gives you a certain level of agency and leverage. But the story, this story that you're telling or helping other people to tell, providing the framework in which other people can tell, tell it, remains the, 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 the exception, not the rule. The architecture is, as you say, because forcing itself into... Um, it's great, more and more specialization and greater and greater irrelevance. And it was a point that Al Parvin made in his TED talk about architecture for the 1%, that we have a business model, in fact. It's not just that we don't do a very good job. We have a business model that doesn't actually work for the majority of people. So we don't get included in volume house building. We don't get included in vast quantities of urban production because our business model is so damned expensive or so, I, I don't know what it is. There's, there's something peculiar about the whole enterprise itself. Agreed. And it's not just the way that we think about stuff, but I mean, but, but it is also the way that we think about stuff. And I think this, you know, without, I don't want us to talk about one book and then talk about the other. And the second book of yours, Working at the Intersection, Architecture After the Anthropocene, which you edited with um, Naomi House, um, that's also talking about how architecture can crack open its shell and make itself more relevant to a, a broader society, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's nice. Uh, I think that's a nice way of thinking about it in, in an expansive sense. I mean, very specifically, the intentions behind the book were quite maybe different. Mm -hmm. um, so thanks for that compliment, um, unsolicited. Um, actually, the book was confirmed with the fact that a lot of ecological discourse um, you know, in architecture, frankly, it's terribly weak. Um, and and actually, more generally, ecological discourse tends to be dominated by a bunch of, you know, old white guys from a certain region and demographic. And of course, I should emphasize as, a, you know, someone interested in whether and how, whether first of all, it's possible, but if, if it is, then how to um, decolonize education um, mm -hmm. and, and trying to run my own proto experiments rather than just talk oh, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Well, mm -hmm. you know, off we go back to our usual curriculum, pedagogies, et cetera, yeah. within the same imperialist infrastructure of our education institution, you know, to be continued, is it possible then? Um, but, you know, while I tamper and play with the idea of, of what a prototypical pedagogy for decolonization is, rather than just simply make a claim to doing it, um, I felt that there needed to be a space in which the discourse around ecological um, architecture in some ways um, could be expanded um, to include voices that are never really part of, of, of the discourse, mm -hmm. which is why, you know, 
in all my books, there's always an acknowledgement in the introduction about one, that I always give a student a platform because I think that architectural education isn't just about preparing everybody for architecture or beyond that careers. Um, it's also about making sure that we have, you know, a different kind of leadership in architectural education going forward and a different kind of profile in our woefully undiverse faculties. Um, and so that book, um, and, and as with the others, it, th that disclaimer is always there. And there's always an acknowledgement that, in fact, having done our best, whoever I'm writing with or editing with, um, that we've not met our targets for, for diversity of voices. You know, there's an apology almost in every book about, you know, not enough women or not enough people from a certain demographic or whatever it is. So this book won't set out to be intentionally not that. Um, and so it was really a book that came from talking to people I thought I needed to give a platform to within the framework of an architectural design studio textbook, because that's what the RBA design studio series is. It's intended as a studio textbook. Um, and to also not just plop it in there, but to think about how, you know, one could frame the writing and the work and the thinking of, of voices that we don't really see or center in architectural ecological discourse um, as, you know, deployable for, for students at every level, not just, you know, graduating or master's level students, but undergraduates too. So it's very much a studio resource of thought. So that was in the premise. Yeah. And also this idea of what is post-anthropocentric thinking. For those that don't know the book title, I mean, this notion is within intersectionality. Kimberly Crenshaw in 1991 talked about intersectionality and that's when the theory really came about. And for those who want a quick, you know, kind of, a fag packet explanation to use a, a British ancient colloquialism, which I'm very fond of, you know, LGBTQ kind of narrative phrase, to be honest. Um, but yeah, so this idea of this fag packet narrative is that, you know, in a way, um, intersectional intersectionality theory is just about the idea that one could be oppressed or marginalized because one is a woman, but if one is black and a woman, uh, you know, doubly oppressed, and if one is disabled, black and woman you know, and poor as well, then we have a situation. So it's understanding that, you know, in, it's not about, you know, one for one, it's not an eye for an eye when it comes to disadvantage. There are, if you like, consolidations of, of if you like, discrimination that impact on people's ability to, you know, situate themselves as, as, as having influence over society. Mm. Um, and so that was the question, you know, intersectional work, which was really what we were trying to do. We were intersecting with our own limitations as women, as, you know, queer community members and so on, to think a bit about how do we have, how do we kind of sense voices in this way, but not in a way that makes it inaccessible to people who don't identify with us or don't share our identities, for example. Um, and that felt really important. And then the bit about post-Anthropocene, which is the subtitle. I mean, first of all, anthropocentric just means, you know, human-centered. We talk about the Anthropocene as being this era in time where humans dominated the world and, you know, somewhat hilariously given this wonderful opportunity to turn it into a kind of smash and grab and destroy pretty much everything in the process, including ourselves, ironically. So that went well. Um, and this, of course, this idea of post-anthropocentric thought, which is the, the new go-to for, oh God, we're rubbish as, you know, being anthropocenes, let's quickly like dash off into post-anthropocentric existence and discourse. Um, it, is that actually we think it's a huge conceit that we're not even in an anthropocene, you know, we've not even understood what it is to be human. We talk about humanity and humanism, and actually we don't really have much in the way of humanity, you know, to paraphrase Mahatma Gandhi. We're still figuring out what it is to be human or to have human, humanistic or humane qualities um, to our actions and our behaviours. So I think that was what the book tried to interrogate, taking some of these terminologies that I think provide ideological safe houses for many of us and, and confronting them and unpackaging them and, and unpackaging them by looking at them through the lens of what it is to be marginalised and to actually, while everyone in architecture schools is having their, their high highfalutin talks about, you know, all of these key issues and appropriating the discourse from, you know, scientists and, 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 and real experts in climate crisis and climate change. Um, nothing's really changing in what we're producing. So we can have all our little internal chats in the comfort of the faculty lounge, but what is actually changing about what we produce? You know, we still think buildings are the answer, for example, so we're a long way off figuring mm. that out. Um, and so that was the book, that was the premise of it. Um, and the people in it are, are astonishing. I think my advice to anyone who wants to write or who is writing, you know, make sure that you surround yourself with people who are far better than you at all times. It's really the best approach with everything. And, and I just want to acknowledge that there's some great thinkers in there 
who I won't do justice to if I tried to summarise what they've contributed. Um, but their words, I think, are very important and worth seeing. And many of whom are practitioners, so they aren't just writing things in the bubble of the faculty lounge, they are actually out there um, reimagining what um, this kind of post-anthropocentric or rejection of post-anthropocentric space um, is and, and what true ecological impact can be yeah. using um, you know, architectural paradigms. I think that's really good. I mean, the first book, Architects After Architecture, I don't know what order they were published in. In fact, I think Intersections comes before Architects After Architecture. But anyway, that's right. People yeah. like jo people like Joss Boyd, they're also talking about this. I mean, she's she's an extraordinary writer, thinker, and practitioner. And um she she's also thinking about this this idea, I suppose. You use this word ecology, and I, I really like this. And I I try and apply this this notion of ecology to broader environments. We could talk about social ecologies. And one of the things that we're talking about when, when you talk about these things, I, as I read it, is you're talking about the failure of postmodern or late modern, late capitalist society to produce healthy ecologies, both like vegetative ecologies and animal, uh, you know, the animal world, but also social spaces, um, economic ecologies. Like we, we've, we've made a very good job of kind of messing it up on a number of levels. And I think people like Joss Boys and, and, the, and the, a number of the articles, uh, sorry, essays in, your, in, your, in Architects After Architecture are dealing with an idea of, as I read it, of expanding out architectural practice to improve its, its sort of holistic ecology, to make it a space in which a greater number, if not everybody, a greater number of people can find sustenance, meaning, value, and also professional opportunity within it. So I think there, there, I think there are these lovely um, conversations across the two of them, um, which I, which I, which I really found quite, um, quite, quite good to, to to read through. And and so and as you say, very much textbook based, particularly intersections, which is going to be really useful next year for me. But I want. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about decolonization, because this is something that we're all sort of thinking about and, try, as you say, trying to enact within our curriculum. And I'm going to kind of provoke this by suggesting that if we're going to decolonize a curriculum, we're going to have to lose something. The curriculum, and as you know, trained as an architect, is already rammed full of stuff. Like, who do we get rid of? What do we get rid of? And how do we do this in 30 week years, three times or five times 30 week years? Like, practically speaking, how do we do this? Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, I was distracted by replying to a work text. <laughs> Welcome to the deanship. Um, can you no, just no, repeat no, the question? So, so how do we, yeah, no. <laughs> um, how do we, how do, how do we decolonize a, a, a curriculum? How do we? What do we get rid of? What do we add in? How do we restructure it? Does it does it change structurally? Is it like to do with the whole nature of the educational process, or is there? I can tell you a bit about the experiments I've been running. I don't. I wouldn't say that I'm at prescription stage yet. I wouldn't tell anybody else how to do their thing. I yeah. think that things actually. Perhaps the point is that it's always very contextual. So you start mm -hmm. by looking at what's lacking within your community, in terms of representation both at faculty and student level and then look outside the bloody window actually you know a lot of schools like ours are situated in neighborhoods where there's real need mm -hmm. and the schools just sit in there all day every day you know hundreds and often thousands of students being batch processed through these machines of qualification I wouldn't say education by the way quite intentionally these machines of qualification um, and and there's no you know meanwhile outside the door there's people begging or there's poor people across the street living in buildings that don't have decent air conditioning and who overheat and die in, in summer. In New York, for example, over 100 black people die this summer from heat exhaustion because they don't have access to um, simple things like air conditioning, which they can't afford or they don't have it, um, or um, a tree in the street where they could go and sit outside and get some shade and heat wave. Um, and we don't think that's our problem in architecture schools, and we really should. Mm -hmm. So that's a start. I think that that context thing is the first step one might take. Um, in my case, that's what I've been doing. I also want to say that decolonization, to contest a major misapprehension about it, is not about sweeping away the Cambusian thought or whatever, you know, the, the five men of architecture um, that we've been taught as our kind of allegedly, you know, 
core principles. And, I know and, three and the of them. Orders. Who are the other two? Is it Asplund well, and Khan? Oh gosh, I wouldn't put him in the frame. He's absolutely quite. Sweet. He's really quite sweet, and you know. Um, and I think that rather that he's actually just been one of those relentless. He's just, I think, the mercy of appropriation type architect. Well, I think there's obviously in America it may be different, but Frank Lloyd Wright, Mies, Mies van der Rohe, obviously Cabuzier, um, are the three really obvious ones. And then if you want to sort of spring it forward, and I, I'm not really doing justice here, of course, to to many others. Um, but I think that those three are heavily implicated. But more, you know, contemporaneous references that we tend to all get a bit tired about. You know, Shumi is obviously one. Um, and I think Geary are the really obvious, like, you know, if one is just going to have, um, like, what do students get asked to write about in all their essays and things, it's those. But just to come back to this point about one of the key misapprehensions of decolonization is that there's, you know, one is expected to suddenly sweep it all away and give, you know, marching orders to all the white guys who've been diligently teaching the, the orders um, until they're, you know, past their retirement age and, mm -hmm. in, in one's faculty. Um, and in fact, it's not not that at all. I think that, you know, decolonization is about understanding that if you actually open the floodgates and allow in other voices then what happens to the, these these kind of like principles what happens to this core knowledge or whatever that might mean mm -hmm. is a reappraisal and a deeper understanding it's a bit like saying you know let's never go to rome with students because it's deeply colonial mm -hmm. but that's exactly why one should go there and run a black studies minor there which is by the way what i'm trying to help set up in the school um you know want to move uh, the curriculum in the School of Architecture so people don't just sit there drawing Borromini ceilings but actually start to understand that you know there's massive chunks of Egypt that were just robbed and dumped in the city as icons of the city's architectural heritage which are fact the spoils of, of, of a colonial a bloody and murderous colonial past so there needs to be a, a reappraisal of what these things are mm -hmm. and I think that's important to say um, so that might mean then that when one opens up these the space for what constitutes the core curriculum in architecture, there'd be just a reconsideration uh, and not an annihilation of, of the classics and the alleged orders. And actually maybe something in that is around the idea of an order at all. I mean, let's remind ourselves, architecture is only a few hundred years old um, as a discipline. And before, prior to that, of course, it was a bunch of stonemasons wandering around in, you know, basically, you know, um, rather nice gowns, um, all blokes largely, allegedly anyway. Um, whispering in each other's ears because they were so worried about their knowledge that they didn't want to write any of it down. So it was an oral tradition. That was the pedagogic model. Um, and, and then, of course, it became something, a period of enlightenment, which could be rarefied and made lovely um, into this sort of new thesis around the, the kind of impossibility of, or the impossible opportunities, rather, that um, technology and science was offering us, um, et cetera. Um, and obviously that was the kind of mise-en-scene on colonial um, exploitation and brutality was to get somewhat fixated on you know, the picturesque and other things. Um, and so I think that in the mix of all of that is the reminder that architecture was an invention of a particular set of ambitions, largely by a, a bunch of blokes operating within an imperialist colonial construct to begin with. It wasn't crowdsourced. Oh, I know what I need. I'm poor and I live in the back streets of Paris with no running water. I really need architecture to come and solve this. I don't think anyone really thought that we needed to invent a discipline to sort that shit out. And in fact, you know, architecture, much like other things right now, like radiographers, likely to be extinct soon because all of that can be done using artificial intelligence. I think we need to be cautious to assume that architecture will just carry on because somebody invented it about 250 years ago. Unless we keep questioning where our relevance is and what our impact is and actually start to manifest an actual impact then one should assume that it will be just a confection of nice skills to have acquired at undergraduate level that um, actually resonate far more powerfully in another field. Mm. Um, and that's the issue, isn't it? So I think that um, this idea of decolonization needs to include a questioning as to what the hell a discipline is and whether or not that even needs to be there. These infrastructures we've inherited, much like linguistic frameworks, are just constructs, you know. It, they're not real. <laughs> we invented them all. Mm. They're not laws. They're things that we invented, which means we can get rid of them tomorrow if we like. Mm. So um, we might be so annoying in architecture that eventually people just don't want to use it anymore. It might be so maligned. A bit like doctors used to wander around with leeches and plop them on your body as part of cures. You know, we don't mm. see much of that. And if anyone tried to pull that move, you could imagine there'd be uproar. Well, you know, who's to say that architects a few years from now might be considered the leech bearers of, of future solutions to the climate crisis? It's like this stuff's irrelevant, guys. You know, sit down, be quiet, you know. And I think maybe the third component of 
decolonizing that I'm, tam- you know, again, playing with, tampering with, is really trying to understand that, you know, uh, in a way, what a conference is, and, I, and I'm not trying to do a plug, but we have, we are hosting the AHRA conference in the fall, which is Architecture of the post anthropocene question mark. Um, and that's, you know, Architecture and Humanities Research Association. But the point of that is to, to, again, what's happening is people have to pre-record their papers. So there's these papers go live with a blue screen and we project images onto that blue screen. There's PowerPoint is banned. Um, the majority of people coming are from um, community groups in New York. So the Lenape, which are the first peoples of New York, will have the microphone, will be sitting in circles. Um, will be recording through the talking stick using, again, indigenous methodologies for dialogue. But moreover, we'll be listening, actually. And I think maybe that's one of the key things in decolonization is to actually listen, to hear what other people have to say, to not just sit there in the usual conference suite. And remember, a conference is yet another imperialist construct to make justify academic, academic, academia's relevance and importance is let's all talk to ourselves in a conference centre for 15 minutes. And, and run out of time for questions because we're so self-indulgent and always run over our time. And then at the end, we'll have learned that we all agree that we're all great. There you go. That was helpful. What an amazing investment of educational resources. And I don't want that. And I think we need to stop wanting that too and stop seeing that as the metric by which we judge our relevance. Not, you know, because I don't want to keep throwing stones at practice, by the way. Um, I think we're all in this together. Pedagogy is, after all, not just a reflector, it's a director. So we're all implicated. Yeah. And I think that's important to mention. And our academic constructs are deeply problematic, if not more so, because we're the manufacturers of all of these conceited architects. Mm-hmm. So we need to actually recognise that too. Just to come back to the conference, actually, there'll be no such thing as a name badge. People are first name only and whatever name they want, or they can give their whole name if they want, but they're not, they're not attributed to an organisation, uh, a school or, or anything. Only the speakers are attributed. Well, not speakers, but the community members, the Lenape will be have their identities revealed all the architects will not have an attribution they can be students professors whatever it doesn't matter but they're not they don't carry any assignation that's important we felt um so so yeah so i'm interested in being in that place it's not an act of subterfuge it's intended to just strip in many ways the comforts of all of these qualifications and titles that people like murder each other to acquire and themselves um and actually in devoid of all of that bling, that identity bling, can actually have a meaningful conversation and learn something. That's what I want this conference to do, so that, to give people a chance to really authentically learn. And they can't do that if all they care about is whether or not, you know, their slides are in order and they stick within their nine minute window and anyone asks them a question that they can answer. But I, 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 thought, I think that's an amazingly, an amazingly good description of this notion of of the of the of the practice, I suppose, of decolonization. And I really liked your third point. This idea, well, your first and your your third points, I think, have um, some parallels. This idea of looking out the window, and this idea of listening to people. This idea of like seeing, not looking, but seeing. Because architects, are, I think, are very good at looking. We look and then we see what we want to see, and and actually like opening your eyes, as you say, and seeing the poor people across the street, seeing the kind of social condition that you live in, seeing the, the nature of the, the uh, socio-cultural context is really important. And this idea of listening for other, other people is, is a beautiful idea. And I, uh, you know, it's sort of, it would seem to me, and it's mysterious to me that it isn't, but it would seem to me to be undeniable. You know, it's, it's perfectly um, a reasonable thing. But there's something else that I wanted to come back to, which is in this idea of so you talked about taking your students, your black students, to to Rome. Um, well, all students, but just changing the curriculum. Definitely never isolating a demographic. Okay, thanks. I just think um, that we need to sort of the yeah. black studies minor. We have a black studies minor. Uh, I see. Right, right. And okay. where we are right now in the discussion is how do we, you know, rather than reject Rome and say, oh gosh, let's mm. not go there anymore because it's so problematic. It's like no, let's absolutely go there and start changing how we understand and interpret the city and where we place our attention and confronting the fact that that's basically a looter's bag, you know, the whole city. Um, And the fact that it's been, yeah, true. But Rome isn't this this the heart of the urbanization problem, isn't it? It's like urbanization Mm -hmm. as, as, as countries become expansionist, colonially expansionist, they start to urbanize because they no need, no longer need to rely on their, immediate environs for their food and resources 
which is being imported. So as China has become expansionist, so it has urbanized. As America expanded across its territories and then in the 20th century across the world, it urbanized itself and it stopped being a rural economy. And Britain likewise, you know, that you know, Marx talks about this. There's a complete parallel between its development of its exp- and Hannah Arendt talks about it, Max Weber talks about it, parallel between its expansionism and its urbanization because we don't need to farm our land anymore because someone poor over there is doing it for us. But, uh, and yeah, and, and this is your decolonization, uh, Anthropocene, sorry, Intersections book, talks about this idea, the kind of, the profoundly embedded quality of um, inequality that is manifest within not only the buildings themselves, but in the city spaces, the infrastructure. And, and then as you've, I think very clearly described, in our knowledge frameworks as well, our epistemological framing of our realities is likewise embedded within this. And I think that's, uh, I think it's really true. And, and you use that beautiful example. I mean, beautiful is a weird, a weird word, but this idea of these people of color who've been dying in New York from exposure, uh, from lack of AC, basically, lack of shade, um, is, is something to do with environmental justice, isn't it? And this comes back again to this idea of breaking apart the boundaries. Like architecture doesn't deal with environmental justice. We deal with buildings. Mm-hmm. And when we spoke a while back, you talked about this, what you called the three O's, the object orientated ontology. And I wondered if you could tell a little bit about that and how you're dealing with that kind of thing within prep. So how do you, you look out the window and you listen to people then what do the projects look like? Well, first of all, question whether or not the project is one that we produce or simply enable, facilitate, um, and also whether the project to get away from architecture's predisposition towards, you know, a kind of spatial Tourette's where the only possible solution to any problem is a building. Mm-hmm. Um, the idea that actually there are other things that will utilise all of our architectural training, but don't object. So... For those not familiar with triple O, as we often call it, it sounds a bit like a battery. Um, but if I'd say if it was a battery, then it'd be one of those ones that runs out really quickly um, halfway through Christmas Day and leaves toddlers wailing because their special toys no longer working. But triple um, O, this idea of uh, the object, uh, you know, an, an object ontology, this idea that actually, you know, these objects, what we create, you know, and by the way, we create 30,000 new products and devices every year globally as if we need that you know, extra fast version of a hairdryer or, uh, or Apple to change its bloody recharging sockets one more time, you know, just for fun. Um, all of these ch- innovations, allegedly, um, that seem utterly necessary, yeah. you know, question mark, etc., cetera, um, are things that, um, that we see as measures of a productive, advanced technology, technological driven society, which is why when you had, you know, um, that, you know, that conversation with, uh, Comedy Grok about actually, you know, needing to redesign Gaia. That actually Gaia's issue was that she just hadn't quite figured out as a planet how to accommodate humans, and the architects could help with that. It was just one of the best ever kind of mansplainy, manspready, you know, kind of like patriarchal conceits I'd ever heard. This side of you know, I don't know, some sort of. Um, who who uh, did? Was that something that you were both contesting? Was that something you were both contesting, or was this something? That no, he wrote, wrote about it. It was <laughs> yeah, it was that nonsense thing about you know, it was one of those classic Dazine things. Dazine, I love. You know, I love the way that they give platforms to people like Schumacher and and, and comedy just to actually you know get people to drink their coffee faster and get cross about stuff because they they like putting provocateurs in there um, when they're not putting in you know some sum- sumptuous illustrations of what an object ontology is. But I think that um, one of the things that is this problematic about you know triple o object oriented ontology is the idea that in in being able to externalize in, in in a way what an object is this idea that we produce this thing and then it has its own life and actually its own volition after thereafter like a piece of i don't know self driving car and it all and and it's no longer our responsibility or that plastic bottle that you used to drink your drink earlier that you put into the recycling in good faith and assumed that something magical would happen to it other than and not necessarily that it gets shipped to china or actually just get dumped in the ocean because China aren't accepting most of America's recycling right now. But the point is that these objects, in my view, actually, they, much like the trash island, which I'm sure you know is the size of Russia and floats between Japan and California right now, full of dead sea creatures and goodness knows what, um, all amalgamated and largely comprised of the world's trash. Um, you know, 
it's practically, it's almost habitable land, ironic really, and maybe Maldivians might want to move there when we eventually annihilate their entire country because it's about to go under the water because of melting ice caps. But I think that, um, you know, that's the interesting thing that in this triple O is a conceit that allows us to disassociate and in many ways divorce ourselves of the responsibility of all these many objects, formalist driven objects and artifacts that we generate as these signifiers of progress, innovation, mm -hmm. technology, blah, blah, blah. And in fact, they're not going anywhere. They're coming back at us. They're floating back towards our coastlines and threatening to be, let's just say, a different kind of tsunami. And I think that that's the issue, isn't it? That we send off these things, these invisible things. And in the past, that invisibility of our you know, consumption, excessive consumption, excessive greed, was really just something that popped up on you know, the doorstep of black people, largely, or black and brown people who live in what we fondly term non-geographically the global south. So, you know, that's where, of course, most acute climate change manifests within that region. So it was rather convenient, of course, that I can still look out of my window in Dumbo and see a peaceful, serene waterfront that's robust and not flooding. I mean, obviously, I was here during Hurricane Sandy years ago, and that's a different story. But right now, I feel pretty safe that my basement's not about to flood all over again, and I'm not going to have all my power, no power for three weeks and no subways, etc. Um, and if that happens, then at least I know, oh, well, in three weeks time, it'll be fixed. But not so for people right now who are, you know, living in, in parts of India that will never recover, parts of Bangladesh that will be irretrievably lost to, to sea level rise. Um, not to mention the impact of, of you know, weather systems, um, even internally within the US, like we're just about to enter hurricane season, you know, hundreds of lives will be lost as they are every year, as the hurricane ferocity gets more and more acute. So I think that um, this idea of triple O is a dereliction of a responsibility. Um, and I think that's the issue. So if we just take buildings, for example, before people think, oh, that's very nice. But architects are very responsible. Our buildings, we always design them so they last forever. Well, that's hilarious because, of course, they don't because someone comes along and knocks it down, builds something bigger and better and more efficient years later or not. Maybe just more bling, depending. Um, but the point is, of course, architecture isn't some permanent thing. It's not. It has an afterlife and that afterlife is about the energy it consumes, the air conditioning, the glazing, the solar gain. And the fact that unless you can press on, and you and light the place it's probably uninhabitable your toilets won't flush you can't use your internal bathrooms the elevator doesn't work so all of these things are dependent on energy systems which um you know at the moment are dependent on fossil fuel largely and not you know alternative energy autonomous energy so there's a con set of contingencies around architecture that i think you know when i think back on one of my most influential or the mo one of the most influential people in my writing which is jeremy till in architecture depends the sheer contingencies that in one chapter he describes architecture as waste in transit. Well, I think it's waste before it's even begun. So if we look at what architecture is comprised of, you know, its materiality is largely derived from, you know, places outside of the country in which we man manifest a building. It's imported and shipped. Um, it's often extracted from the ground using, you know, questionable labour laws um, and employment rights, um, sometimes child labour. Um, you know, there are you know, millions of slaves still in the world. So actually we're not in a post-slavery state yet either, by the way, and 7% of the construction industry in the US is modern slavery, um, just to put that in perspective. So I think that, you know, these buildings, um, as we make them, you know, they don't have an ability, especially if they're new build, I think, to really outlive the, po or I think, respond and adapt to the possibilities ahead of us regarding climate crisis. And I think that the problem, so the triple O confrontation is, is a way of saying this stuff is coming back at you. You shouldn't just be thinking about stylistically, is this building beautiful and clever? You should be thinking about the responsibilities of the afterlife of that building. Can it, in a crisis, operate autonomously in terms of energy? You know, Can it withstand hurricanes, tornadoes, tsunamis? Um, in fact, billions of people moving because of climate change, which is now the greatest migration crisis ever we've ever faced, which is not people fleeing war, is people fleeing climate crisis and climate collapse. Um, and then, of course, you know, questions about the toxicity of the specifications, not just their origins. Did it exploit people on the way over here before somebody stamped it as being ethically sourced, which frankly is rubbish. Um, in fact, it's much more to do with what happens when this thing starts to biodegrade. Does it poison people? Is it even biodegradable to begin with? Will it create a toxicity crisis that will in some ways go on and on? We talk about public indemnity in architecture and always think, yeah, that's hilarious. That's limited to a period of time after the building is built and signed off by the client. And then at some point in the future, you kind of time out on that. Well, wouldn't it be interesting if we suddenly said, no, you're responsible forever. Um, you're responsible for every last bit of that building and its afterlife. And if, if it doesn't decompose and not poison anyone, but creates instead a health hazard or an environmental crisis, then actually that's on you. 
So, you know, I think that we are not teaching education that really understands that our, what we see to be our responsibilities are far greater than the, the mere production of a building that somebody else then takes responsibility for. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, we shouldn't really be doing any new build. We should be working with the materials we have and the spaces that we have and thinking about how we can in many ways understand that while technology continues to advance, what it needs to, to do that in the way that we understand technological advancement is, is so devastating and so destructive that in fact we should be looking the, the greater innovations are understanding the potential of of many analog traditional vernacular established technologies and not trying to find these new solutions because that's just science fiction fantasy talk that's not reality we haven't got time for any more of that self-indulgence we need to work with what we have sorry long answer but no 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 way. brilliant brilliant answer i I've, I've got one more question um I've got one more question that I, I, I suppose it troubles me a little bit. One of the things that um, I, I always pick up from this sort of conversation is this idea that there is, in a way, that globalization constitutes a practical problem. It's a problem because it precipitates things like very unequal working conditions for, for example, for uh, lower income communities in uh, less economically developed countries um, to the benefit of, of richer countries. Um, but it also does this other thing of erasure of, it creates this kind of hypermodernist monoculture of experience. So we have this kind of, that that's one perhaps legitimate critique or questioning of, of globalization. But on the other hand, your approach seems to promote a kind of globalization as well, insofar as it's, it talks about generating networks of solidarity between um, uh, connected social groups. Say, for example, let's say feminists globally connecting with each other to uh, fight for representation. So um, in, in uh, recognition and rights in, in um, less privileged spaces. How do we, how do we, uh, that uh, feminism is a bit of a red rag really, and, and perhaps not um, a useful example here, but there are many other movements. Say, for example, uh, uh, economic um, marginalization is addressed through global networks. So we've got this kind of we've got this kind of tension between the problems of globalization, which are really problems of neoliberal industrialization, and also the the, po the potential positives of globalization through, for example, the capacity to provide voice, uh, resources, um, uh, and share knowledge between. Uh, global communities and for me it always seems like you can't have one without the other so you're going to get if you're going to do the good one the good the second version of globalization which is good you're going to end up with the first one as well and if you do the first one you might end up with the second one and i just wondered whether that you had any thoughts about this this idea that you know when you're when you're pursuing solidarity orientated work like this book on intersectionality, but also the, 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 the book on um, alternative modes of practice. You're, come, you're kind, you know, that it's the Audre Lorde thing. You're using the tools of the master purportedly to disassemble the master's house, but how can you? Is that really possible? Um, okay, well, yeah. Well, funny, isn't it? We just, I've just been waffling on rather. I'd like to say extolling, you know, wisdom, but no. Waffling on about technology use. And technology actually, its etymological meaning is, is tool. Mm. Um, and so, because we think we've been seduced into thinking that technology is all about something that requires a plug socket um, and not something that's actually just about a methodology um, for confronting things. I mean, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, I always fascinated by the way that these objects, coming back to the triple O thesis, have everything has a latent quality and you know you could say for example in the case of a knife you could cut a tomato and feed people with it or you could stab somebody horrendously and murder them so there's always when we think a bit about you know what would you know this idea that actually coming back to Audre Lorde's quote and for those that don't know her you should definitely read more of her she's a brilliant lesbian feminist writer American a black American woman um, who's been hugely influential actually over my pedagogy um, in fact, uh, along with Bell Hooks, um, again, another recommended read. Um, and I think that, you know, what's interesting about this is, of course, what constitutes a tool? Well, you know, um, I think that, you know, we are, if I was to search around and, and say, 
I want to uh, to create a community, a collective consciousness. Even um, you talked about solidarity. That's another way of putting it. I suppose you know a, a group, a social movement of some sort around a particular paradigm, whether that's you know radical transformation, architecture, education. If you want to be specific, you know what would we do? Would we deny as problematic all resources, all thoughts, all theories prior to now? And coming back to the decolonization point, not so much. You know the the ways in which we can utilize what we have as our knowledge frameworks, our skills, our tools, um, in ways that have just different outcomes. Um, a tool carries the values we assign it and the intentions we assign it. That's it. You know, um, and I think that we get a bit flustered thinking about the idea that you know can we necessarily do something radical within an institution? So in my case, could I run a democratic school? And I would say a bit, not much much because within an infrastructure that is hierarchical there are some things I can do and other things I really can't um, and and that's been you know that was the why I applied for the job not because I thought oh deans I've met so many charming ones they all seem so lovely I'm sure I should do this I thought god most of the deans I've known to be totally blunt pretty dreadful and often quite narcissistic and you know showed up employed all their mates and then you know determined that we all convene around a particular aesthetic agenda or else kind of thing it's like oh great um and not much in the way of democracy um and more like delegation actually yeah. here you go go and do bits of my job i'm going to go off and do fabulous things um just saying like lived experience and all um and so i wanted to do something which was much more about trying to crowdsource what the school could be understanding what it was already you know mm-hmm. mapping its skill sets and everything else before then trying to set an agenda for what the school should aspire to become that felt that it was collectively configured and co-created so mm-hmm. that therefore there'd be stakeholder buy-in um, and that's difficult, you know, it's a bit like saying, you know, if you crowdsource, if you or if you have these kind of social movements or collectives of thought, that you're all going to agree on anything. There's no possibility of that. There's no possibility of finding a synthesis of everyone's intentions and ambitions. Mm-hmm. You know, you can create a crude um, vehicle for the transformation. But, it, it, you know, to suddenly start to reinvent tools is a tricky one because to reinvent anything requires, uh, you know, taking on you know, some methodology that's already been established or used before. So I wrote a paper with Jen Barton, who's at the Royal College now teaching interior design, but she was at Brighton before, which was looking at, um, you know, basically how do you create a tool, a new tool? And we ran a workshop, uh, a conference on architecture's feminisms in Stockholm, where we took loads and loads of random shit on our carry-on luggage, including like things like tampons and stuff and plastic guns, and laid them out on this huge table, invited people to make new tools for architectural purposes architectural creation and you know and then photograph them they had to label them so there was this whole taxonomical invitation um, and then they had to label them and there were some really lovely things that came up you know somebody had basically glued some tampons onto a set of headphones and said because you know this is you know artifact for architects to listen to clients and things um, and then you know rather than designing with CAD somebody had basically just strapped a load of you know feathers onto the end of a pencil and you're supposed to sort of stroke dirt in order to create architecture space so I think that you know one can take tools if I was to you know if you like take a, a expand on Audrey's thesis perhaps and say you know yeah maybe you can't deconstruct the master's house yeah a bit tricky it's a hard to get a job and then take apart the institution that's hired you admittedly um, and I'm not sure it's viable but I think that um, elsewhere one can take if you like the infrastructures and play with them and start to think about what can you do to reconfigure them and redirect them. So as an example of that, we created, I created within the first year of my hire, a deanship for students. So now that we have two student deans in my office, which is great. And they have a big say in how we run the school. We have 13 diversity groups in the School of Architecture alone, not to mention the Institute's own diversity groups. And that's representing different demographics and different interest groups, as well as professional student organisations as well. And they sit on a dean's council that advises the dean's office. So we also created a faculty council in the past, full-time permanent hires, we call them tenured here, were the people that advised the dean through a governing group. And I thought that was a bit limiting because it was just the people with security of employment who got to tell me how to run the school. So we created a council where every profile of, of employee, not just in terms of their hiring status, but also their demographic and their department was represented. And they are also the key influence over what the school can do. So the tools are committees, which are established tools, or their dean's office employees. So, you know, Audrey's right. You can't dismantle, but you can redirect. um, And that's important. And for now, 
even that is challenging to do. Even that is frightening for people to do. People don't want change. You know, they don't. They say they do, but they don't. What does architecture look like in 10 years' time, do you reckon? Oh, gosh. Um, very good question. But I'd like to think we're still here in 10 years. I'd like to think that architecture's just radically changed itself. Mm-hmm. I'd like to think that all those students that went off and did other things actually are leading everywhere else, which is actually what they're doing already, by the way, because I think Architects After Architecture Illustrates, politicians, game designers, you know, these people are at the top of whatever industry they've gone into outside of architecture. Um, I like to think that architecture honestly could give call all those people architects and stop saying only people that make buildings um, are architects. I think we need to understand that Understanding the scale of our influence is about recognising the fact that we, our greater influence, in my view, resides beyond the production of buildings. I mean, I'd rather run a school of the environment than a school of architecture, apart from the fact I've got 11 disciplines in a school of architecture and only one of them is architecture. It'd be nice if there was some acknowledgement of the role of planners and landscape architects and you know, not to mention other spatial designers in creating and curating and co-creating the built environment. And also the unbuilt environment, which is why I wouldn't want to call it a school of the built environment either, because we actually need to stop building, to be honest. We need to just stop. Um, we might need to unbuild um, or reconfigure buildings um, or not build. And those are really where we should be centering our attention, not on the production of architectural forms, but actually on doing the opposite of working with the forms we've created to actually make them viable. Sort of retrospective retro engineering of all of the I think detritus that architecture has been responsible for for many decades, if not centuries, that would be a good place to start. Um, And I'd like to think as well that we stop talking rubbish. Um, We do that a lot. We make claims to expertise we don't have. Um, We think that the obfuscation of what we do in the way that we define it is what adds its value, Um, in a a way imbues it with its status and, and superiority over other people in the design team, people in communities, clients and so on and in fact it doesn't it just make us largely despised and continually and expansively irrelevant um i'd like to think that we learn to listen and have learned and actually um are in many ways just for a while um able to consider the possibility that it would be lovely when the aliens land um come you know coming after the sixth mass extinction perhaps and find all of this destruction um architects aren't largely implicated be nice to think that actually in some ways, we've potentially the unsung heroes of a change that was too late, that was too late in happening. But I'd rather be that side of it, that side of alien history books than the side we're currently on. That's a brilliant point to finish on. Thank you ever so much, Harriet. That was superb. You're welcome. You can't argue with that. Well, maybe you can. Anyway, Thanks hugely to Harriet for sharing her thoughts, time and passion. Thanks to Routledge and Reba for the books. Follow the links in the podcast description for the books on their websites and for Harriet's professional profile and some of her other recordings. And don't forget to like, subscribe, follow and share. A is for architecture, here, there and everywhere. Cheers.